Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Exploring Reality. I'm going to say something a little different this time around because my friend Parker from Parker's Penzies is here. And per, her, per his suggestion, my new uh, tagline is, It's exploring time. <laughs> So I um, I really hope you appreciated that, Parker. Um, I have one of my favorite philosophers ever, uh, Dr. Joshua Rasmussen here. You guys have seen him before, but if you're not familiar with Dr. Josh Rasmussen, um, Josh, why don't you just kind of quickly introduce yourself and um, what we're going to talk about today? Yeah, thank you. It's great to be with you. I am a object made out of parts. We're going to be talking about that, <laughs> how objects can be made out of parts. And uh, I like to tell people that I'm a person, but that's not all that I am. Uh, I also am a philosopher. And one of my goals is to understand things as deeply as I can. So my latest project has been about conscious beings and trying to understand who we are, how we could exist, how we could be connected in the world of atoms. So that's awesome. it. So I, uh, I told the audience that we'll take questions at the end, but really quick, this is a really important one from Joe. Question for Josh, why are you such a legend? <laughs> well, I love that question coming from Joe, the legend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. I yes. can't answer that. You, you have to answer that for me. So. I agree with that. I love Joe. I love Joe. He's awesome. All right. So um, I'm really excited to talk about what we're going to talk about today, because this has also been something that's been top of my mind, because um, as you know, I... I I'm, I really can't like marry myself to either idealism or a type of dualism. I'm, I'm still kind of like caught in the weeds there and I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I lean towards idealism and one of the, and the topic we're discussing today is one of the, is like one of the reasons why I think I lean towards idealism more. It's that myriological puzzle. Like what are you and how do you fit into like a material world? Um, and the reason why for me, it's like really important is because as, as a Christian, I believe that, you know, the eschatological view and the hope that we have as Christians is that we'll be physically resurrected from the dead. And then the question in my head is like, what does that mean? Yeah. And how do, how do I like fan whatever I am, <laughs> right? Um, what does that mean for me to be physically resurrected from the dead in the eschaton as well? So I've been really pondering this and I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. And I just want to say, I was actually thinking earlier today about the different views in their names, physicalism, dualism, panpsychism, idealism. And, and I was I actually had this thought today in, in my car. I was just thinking, it seems like those views are sort of confusing in ways that cause unnecessarily quick polarizations into camps. And one of my projects in this book is to sort of start over. Let's just mm -hmm. start over with basic conceptual pieces and then we can label views later. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say that uh, um, right out the gate because I've also been kind of thinking about mind first views, um, idealism, you mentioned that. And what I've realized is different ways of carving out the views. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that these myriological puzzles, these puzzles of parts and holes that we're going to be talking about. When I was in graduate school, we were at a table with some friends talking about this. These puzzles were kind of the biggest puzzles for us. Like these were the ones that kind of changed the game in terms of our view of the nature of ourselves. It mm -hmm. really was because of these puzzles. And it's so fascinating to me because a lot of the popular discussions that I'm seeing and even discussions deeper in, not, not so popular um, in academic halls, tend to kind of be focused on aspects of consciousness, aspects of the brain, aspects of causal interaction without mm -hmm. talking about how parts and holes go together. And I just think that that is leaving out treasures and treasures and treasures of yeah. potential insight into who we are to understand how we could be related to our parts. So I agree with you that the question of parts and holes is, is one that can help us sort of think, think, um, fill out our own views. Yeah. And, and so you gave a recent talk on worldview design, um, which uh, for the audience as well, if you're interested in joining that community, it's in the description of this video. There's a link to join and sign up. Josh hosts it, and there's a, there's philosophers on there and tons of like-minded thinkers on there where we kind of just sort through these things. And so recently, Josh, you gave an, you gave a talk on there, kind of outlining your thought processes on this myriological puzzle. Um, and so I don't know where exactly you'd like to start today. Um, do you want to start by outlining the different views, or how do we go about 
like, I guess the first thing in my mind is whenever I'm doing something like this is like, what is the problem? What is the question we're trying yeah. to answer? And then typically that leads down the rabbit hole of other questions I might be trying to, <laughs> to, to answer too. And so there's so many different ways to go at this and start. What do you, what do you think is like the best way? I think a good question would be something like, um, how am I possibly related to a world of atoms? Or mm -hmm. maybe another way of putting it is like, how do I as a personal being or conscious being fit into a world comprised of atoms? Mm -hmm. And you can think of atoms as what physicists would say atoms are, or you can think of them more sort of theoretically as just like whatever the smallest building blocks of reality yeah. are. Um, how, how are we related to atoms? That would be the question. And then we can look at different theories of how to answer that question and some different um, problems with those theories. And kind of my way of thinking about this is I like the metaphor of a pathway. So if we're on a pathway, each step in the path is going to involve looking at a certain answer to how am I related to atoms and then talk about maybe some objections to that theory until we reach certain theories that I think can answer the question without those particular problems. Um, and so kind of what's at stake is the kind of beings we are. Like, what yeah. are we? What kind of beings are we in relation to the, um, the, the world of, of atoms? How does that work? And, and I think just reflecting on this can help us get clarity as to what the options are. And that by itself, like from any viewpoint, I think is going to empower all of us, no matter kind of where we land at the end of the day, all of us will be, become more powerful to think about who we are by understanding the range of options. Because for me, when I got to graduate school, started studying this, I had no idea what these problems yeah. were or what range of options there were to even think about this. And it wasn't until I started to see, oh, okay, there's this option, which is actually different from this option. Like those were sort of collected in my mind as sort of one tree. And it's like, no, those are different options. So then I can think about them differently. And so that that's kind of where I see us going, going through. The yeah. Different options. And I'm really, I'm really glad you bring that up. Cause at, when I was thinking about this a few weeks ago, one of the things that like, you know, whenever you're like thinking about a topic and the, how do I word this? It's almost like how you take for granted how simple something might be when it's actually not. And I guess the better way of phrase, like putting this would be to just give, kind of give you the example. Um, when I was asking myself this question, I was like, okay, what are the options on the table for what kind of being I could be? I kind of made it simple at first. I was, and I just said I could be material or immaterial. Yeah. But it seems like there, it's a little bit deeper than that because when I say I could be material, there is, there's a few different theories of what that actually could mean. I could like you said before, I could be a single atom, I could be multiple atoms, I could be an aggregate of different atoms, like composed fan wise. Yeah. Um, and even if I was an immaterial being, what does that actually mean in terms right. of how I relate to the physical world, if the physical world exists, all this other stuff. So what with that, like, what are the different views that you see as candidates on the table? So I guess the way that I think is kind of linear where I go through each view and zoom in on it in insane mm -hmm. detail, but I think it would be helpful for me to have a bird's eye kind of pointing to the different views. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking on the spot now about like whether there's a way of dividing all the views into two. I sort of like that, you know, this like material and immaterial. Um, but I don't really have that division in this particular case. So yeah, I like to kind of think more about that. Um, but the, the, re the views that I have roughly are, um, just to kind of use this as an illustration, I'll say this represents a mindless atom, a mindless atom. So it's an, it's a basic unit of reality. It's unconscious, doesn't have thoughts or feelings or any consciousness at all. And so then one view would be that, um, I am this mindless atom. That's what I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would be one view. Another view would be that, um, I am multiple, uh, mindless atoms. So mm -hmm. I'm not one mindless atom. What I am is many mindless atoms. That's a second mm -hmm. view. Uh, a third view would be, no, no, no. It's not that I am multiple mindless atoms. It's rather that I'm a, an arrangement of mindless atoms, some kind of arrangement of them. Right. Yeah. Um, so the arrangementist theories, uh, a th uh, fourth view is a random number four. Now fourth view would be that, um, uh, no, I'm, I'm not the at mindless atoms and I'm not an arrangement of mindless atoms. But I'm this other thing, which we might call a unified whole, whose parts are all mindless atoms. 
uh, or whose most fundamental parts, let's yeah. say, are mindless atoms, the kind of unified whole theory. Um, and then another view after that would be that, well, okay, okay, back, back up. So in the unified whole theory, we could divide that between two types. One is that the, the whole itself exists prior to its parts. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that like what it is to be you is explanatorily prior to what it is for those parts to be them. Uh, yeah. That'd be like one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is that your existence doesn't depend on those atoms, but dependence could go the other way, but may not go the other way, but your existence doesn't depend on those atoms. So you, you exist prior to those parts. Um, the other is that the parts exist prior to you. Okay. Now, if the parts exist prior to you, then the mindless atoms is prior to the thing that has a mind. Gotcha. Um, right. And then if in the other way, the thing that has a mind, if you have a mind exists prior to the mindless parts that you have. Um, and then a, a final view would be that you exist and the atoms are not literally parts of you. You're just something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now actually that I just went through that list, I, I realized I can divide them into two types. So one type, and this is convenient for me because people know that I've been talking about mind first views and mindless first views. Yeah. So all of those different theories can divide in those two. So basically either you have the mindless first where the basic units of reality are mindless bits. And then if you exist, you're grounded in the mindless. Um, and yep. then alternatively, there's the mind first where you exist, you have a mind, um, but your existence doesn't hinge upon mindless atoms. So that, that would be the range of, of options. Yeah. So yeah, they do fall into those two. It depends on how you want to parse that on yeah. define things, I guess, right? Yeah. Like they fall into material or immaterial, depending on what you even want to say that material even means. If you're an idealist, um, well, that's let's say, open up that. You know, the, the, mind, the mind first allows you to be a materialist, a mind first. So, you know, in my book, I talk about mindful materialism, where you yeah. have the basic units of reality are material um, and they're mental. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, so we have like a layout of these different views. Um, and then one of the questions that's still in my head and maybe we can, we, maybe we'll tackle this too is like, well, and I know this probably wasn't the intention of your talk, but like within this, now the question just off the top of my head that I wasn't planning on addressing was like, if you are this um, mind first thing and you're not material, and the material world is real, like the, again, this just goes into the interaction problem. Um, but that's okay. I don't want to derail us. <laughs> so, um, I'm well, just that will come up. That, that, yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll get there. That's one of the challenges to, yeah. Uh, any kind so, of mind first yeah. So from here, where do you oh, want to go exactly? Well, I kind of like the idea of just step-by-step step looking at each of those views. Okay. And then just yeah. talking about the view, you know, what it is, uh, what's at stake. And then I'll, I'll kind of just share my cards, you know, so why yeah. I'm skeptical of that view or why I, I might endorse that view. So Does that sound like a good we, plan to you? Yeah, that sounds great to me. Did we cover the theory that we don't exist? So that's, yeah, I kind of put that into the idea that you are a mindless atom. Okay. Um, so if you think that you have a mind, then you don't exist as something that has a mind, right? Yeah. Um, but I guess we could say theory zero is that you don't exist. Fair enough. Okay, whether you have a mind or not. Okay, you're neither <laughs> conscious nor unconscious. You're just not even there at all. Yeah. Uh, right. That's theory zero. And um, so, okay, we could start there. Start yeah. with that theory. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I think just a priori, um, most people might agree that it's just, there's a lot of issues that might come up with that, with that, with that view of eliminativism, right? Because to even have a view, you might say that you, you need to exist to have the view. Um, what else would you say for that? Right. So in the book, the sort of first step in this dialectic with the eliminativist is what you just described, the self-defeating idea that it's sort of self-defeating to say, hey, I actually think that I don't have thoughts. That's sort of yeah. self-defeating. <laughs> yeah. I say that's the first step on the dialectical path um, because, you know, every every eliminativist worth her salt or his salt is going to, of course, be aware of that uh, rejoinder yeah. and um, has thought through that, right? Um, and sort of a common idea is that is that if we understand mind and thought in the way that we maybe in sort of common ordinary language would sort of think about it from the first person perspective as being like an experience, experiential element in my mind mm -hmm. from the first person, 
uh, the limits of this would say, okay, that's not really real. But what is real is maybe a replacement of that. Um, something in the brain that sort of functions and allows us to talk about minds, to talk about thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess the, the idea is that I don't literally exist. And, and here, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm talking about thoughts and feelings, but the but there's this other issue having to do with my relationship to parts that is about me. The yeah. being that has the thoughts, the being that has the feelings, all right? So even if you thought that there are thoughts and even if you thought that there are feelings, there's a further question about whether there's a being that has those things. Yeah. Um, me, right? Yeah. And I just want to make sure it's clear right out, out uh, of the gate that in saying that I exist, I'm not saying at this point what I am. So all the theories are on the table. Uh, maybe what I am is a brain. Maybe I'm a particle. Maybe I'm an arrangement of particles. Maybe I'm a pattern of particles or a function of particles. All those theories are on the table. So, um, but the eliminativist is saying that I'm none of those things um, and I, I don't exist at all, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I do I do like the self-defeat objection. I think ultimately when I dig deeper in uh, going through those dialectical steps, um, I, I think I've got to somehow defend the power of inner awareness of yeah. me as a conscious being. I think without that, uh, I'm not going to be able to verify my existence. I don't think that I can verify that I exist unless I can verify that the word I corresponds to something that yeah. I can be consciously aware of. Yeah, of course. And I, I really I really appreciate the way that you actually treat the problem, like the, not the problem, the theory of eliminativism in your in your book. Um, I think it was it was actually a really fascinating portion of the book. So I'm actually really, I just, for some, now it's all coming back to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So my, my uh, sort of, my strategy there is just to try to argue that, um, you know, a limitivist usually work with the toolkit of empirical science. Um, so we can do observations with our eyes and with our tools and we can record measurements and, and then come up with theories to analyze those measurements. So yeah. limitivists are usually sort of on board with, with that tool set. And then I just make the argument that in order to use that tool set, I think we actually have to rely on introspection, the power of introspection, to be aware in our own minds of our reasons, of our analysis. Um, I, I say that you can notice, you can observe a tree without introspection, but you need introspection to notice that you're observing a tree. And so mm -hmm. if you're going to write down, hey, I observed a tree, you've got to not just observe the tree, you've got to be able to notice that you observe the tree. Yeah. Um, and so that's going to require introspection. Or so I argue. So I kind of make this argument that the power of introspection, I, I don't claim it's infallible or anything like this, but that, that it's a real tool. And that without yep. this tool, the, the very tools that the the eliminativists usually like to work with, um, you're not going to be able to work with those. Um, I, and yeah. I don't claim to have the final word in, in this dialectical path, but this is, this is sort of like why I am motivated to think that you actually can be aware um, through introspection of you having thoughts and feelings. Awesome. So, yeah. so we, that was theory zero and it's pretty related to theory one, um, by my lights, they kind of share the yeah. same objections. So is there anything else you want to add on with between theory zero and theory one, or do you want to kind of move to theory two? Yeah. So what else do I want to say? So theory one is that you are a single atom. Yeah. And I just wanted to say that just for focus, I'm going to stipulate that atoms are mindless. I'm not ruling this out a priori. I'm just saying if the atoms are mindless, um, then we can ask the question, how are we related to mindless atoms? If we arrive at a theory in which I am fundamentally a mental thing and a simple thing, then that would be a way of saying that I am a, a mental atom. Okay. And mm -hmm. that would be a mind first approach that we could talk about later. But here under the first theories, they're kind of mind first, mindless first theories. And so those are theories on which um, the basic realities are mindless. And so you point to self-defeat because this is exactly what I did in my presentation. I didn't go into the dialectical pathway. I didn't go into that much depth. I just said, here's a challenge for any view on which either you don't exist or you do exist, but you don't have any mind or consciousness. Mm -hmm. And here I'm just thinking of mind just, just neutrally as anything that can include contents of consciousness, thoughts, feelings, intentions, anything like that um, will count as a mind. And so 
yeah, I think there is that that kind of a challenge. You know, if you don't have a mind, you can't even think that you don't have a mind. You can't even doubt uh, yeah. that that you don't have a mind. Um, where the thinking and the doubting is something that I think you can be aware of in first person awareness. Yep. So you don't have to look into brains to see your thoughts. You can just maybe you can see your thoughts in your brains. So you don't have to. That's the idea. Yeah. yeah. I know. I love that. So then theory three was you are some atoms, right? Like you're a group of them or... This is theory two. I think zero is you don't exist. One is you are one atom. Oh yeah, theory, theory two is, is you're a group of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I apologize. I, I messed this up by adding in theory zero, but... <laughs> yeah. I messed it up because you gave the numbers. I'm the one who added in theory zero. <laughs> I'm going kind of off the script for my talk, but yeah, basically that you are some, some atoms. Yep. Yeah. So do you like that one, Dan? So, so off the, so for me, um, I just think, I think it really highlights this mirrorological puzzle question, right? Um, because for me, it's like, okay, if I'm a group of atoms, how can I like continue to exist when something within that group like leaves the group or anything like that? So for, uh, the example you gave in your talk was like, how can I continue to exist when I cut my fingernails, for instance? Right. Now, now that might seem silly. So somebody might say something like, well, what if the mind is just reduced down to the brain or a part of the brain or something like that? It still seems, it still seems to kind of fall prey to the same top, like that same objection, where if I'm identical to this group of atoms, if I change that group of atoms, I, I would expect to not continue to exist, right? Um, at least those are my my thoughts on there. But you're the philosopher, <laughs> so. What I like about these theories is that they help us to focus our attention on different ways of understanding reduction. So mm -hmm. let's say that, you know, what I am is somehow reduced to a nervous system. That's what I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we can divide that theory and let's try to get a little more careful. Like what, what do you mean by that? You yeah. are a nervous system. Are you the atoms that are functioning as a nervous system? Are you the functioning of those atoms? That those are different ideas. The functioning yeah. is different than the atoms themselves. If you say you are the atoms, are you talking about the plural? Or are you talking about a single thing that contains those atoms as parts? Yeah. Again, different theories. Yep. And it's so helpful to, to uh, distinguish these, at least conceptually, and then analyze them one by one. I, I had this fun little uh, social media conversation. I think this was on Twitter with a friend. And they were describing one of these views, this kind of Adam's view that you are Adam's. And then I was distinguishing that view from a different view. Maybe it was the arrangement view. Mm -hmm. um, and they were sort of lumping those into the same analysis. Well, maybe there's some general analysis that can analyze these views under a general um umbrella. But I find it so helpful because they weren't distinguishing these views. And I want to say, hey, there's a very sharp blade that could maybe cut off this view. And if you feel like these other views are still safe from my sharp blade, that's great. But now we've made progress because now we know that that sharp blade will cut away this way of analyzing mind yep. brain dependence or whatever it is, you know, this kind of material view that yep. you are the atoms, right? So I just want to get clear, like what the view is and then how it's different from other views that you are a plural of atoms. That's different from saying that you are an arrangement of atoms, that you are mm -hmm. a function of atoms, or that you are a unified whole built up out of atoms. It's your composition of atoms. It's that you are many things. You are not one thing. You are literally many things. And so what this implies, now we can just see, what does this mean if you are many atoms? If you are these many, many atoms, it means that wherever these atoms go, you go. Yep. Because you are them, right? So wherever they go, so if I clip my fingernails and I am the atoms that include the atoms in my fingernails, then I go with the atoms that I clipped away. Mm -hmm. If one of my atoms, okay, I'm all of those atoms. I'm the, them. I'm not a single atom. It's not like there's this one atom in my brain that that's what I am. That's me. No, no, I'm the many atoms. So if, if one of my atoms go into your body, Than, mm -hmm. and then one of your, like maybe in your cheek, right? And then your cheek atom comes out and this atom here from my cheek goes into your cheek and then... Your, your atom from your cheek goes into my cheek, okay? So we swap yeah. atoms. If I am the atoms, then now part of me is over in your cheek, okay? And a part of you is over in my cheek. That's just how it is. Uh, if I am the atoms. And if, if I am the atoms, then that means that if my atoms go all, one by one, go into your body, 
then I'm literally now over where you're at. I'm not over here anymore. And if my atoms scatter across the universe, then I am scattered across the universe. And if before my mom was born, before my mom was born, my atoms that exist in my body, if those atoms still existed, but just in a different form, that means that I existed before my mom was born. Yeah. Okay. The, the, now, the, this isn't an argument against the view yet. This is just drawing out what it implies. Yeah. Because I think most people who would say that you are reduced to a functioning brain or a brain or something like this, um, I've heard people say what this means is that you are atoms, you are just particles, that's just what you are. But many of those same people would not say that you existed, you literally existed before your mother was born. No, I mean, they, they could say that. Um, that's an option. Yeah. But I would say my, my, my argument against this view, it relies on collecting some first person observational data and then seeing how one of the implications of the, let's call it the many atoms view, seems to not fit that that observation. So my observation is an observation of myself having thoughts and feelings, um, myself having thoughts and feelings from one moment to the next. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I don't, I, I don't claim that this is sort of an easy observation to make. It's almost like I have to close my eyes and like focus on myself having a yeah. thought, and focus on the me having it. And then the me continuing, you know, but I can get myself into a stage like, oh, okay, I had a thought and then I changed and had a different thought. So, and I was me, right? Having those different what thoughts. I, what I find helpful for to like really highlight like introspection, the tool, um, and just how fascinating it is, is whenever, <laughs> so whenever I give talks about this kind of stuff to like even high schoolers, I'll, I'll pass out candy and it's, it'll be like, it'll be like a Snickers bar or something like that. Um, I try to find stuff that has like different textures and everything, everything like that too. So then when they're eating the can, when it's time to eat the candy, I mean, I want to like highlight their tools of in introspection. I tell them to close your eyes and now think about every unique texture, taste, and think about the thoughts you're having, all these different like first person experiences while you're having this. So off more often than not, yummy food helps you do that. <laughs> and so I just, it's, it's fascinating because most of the time these kids will be like, oh, I taste like a little bit of peanut. I taste some chocolate. There's some salt in there. And then I have this texture of like smooth chocolate, but I also have this feeling of it like melting. And then they have the crunchiness. I have the feeling of like this, I have this weird feeling where it's like, I don't have any actual feeling in my teeth, but I feel the pressure between my gums and my teeth kind of like the kids go into detail too. So it's really fascinating this, that power that. of introspection and how much, how much we actually take for granted. Yeah. And you really highlight in that, that in your book as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, in addition to those qualities, there's you having those qualities. Yeah. You know, because like one, one sort of interesting question you could ask, uh, and I've asked my kids this, you know, they, they put up with my questions. It's like, okay, so you know, <laughs> I can't Lana, wait till my kids are older <laughs> to do the same thing. You're going to do the same thing. <laughs> so, so Lana, I'm like, Lana, so, you know, how do you know that this isn't uh, your body? That this isn't your body, this one right here. How do you know that? Well, ultimately, the kids tell me that uh, they can't control this body, right? Well, how do you know that you can't control this body? Well, mm -hmm. then they start using introspection. Well, I don't experience controlling yeah. this body. Oh, okay. But how do you know which experiences in the room are yours? Right? This is now, this yeah. is like very basic. It's like, how do you know? Yeah, yeah. You're aware of a set of experiences through introspection, you're aware of a set um, of experiences. But how do you know which experiences are the ones? that belong to you, to you. You say, well, it's the ones that I am aware of. Okay, you use that word I again, right? Yeah. Well, how do you know that you are aware of them, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> we were sitting around a fire table and I and I was asking um, each of my, okay, yeah, I just have to tell you this because, you no, know, please. I don't know, the, 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 the Twitter conversations get me thinking like, oh yeah, I mean, do, do I really have any knowledge of experiences? You know, like <laughs> they get me questioning these things, right? Yeah, yeah. So I asked my kids, I was like, so Micah, he's 14, you know, I said, is there something that it feels like to be happy? And he's like, yeah, dad. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's good. But then I asked, is there something that it feels like for you to be happy? The, the you, you know, that's the, the being, the one who yeah. has the happiness, right? And he was like, yeah, he didn't even blink an eye. Like, of course, right? Of course. Now we can interpret that in different ways. I understand that. 
but he's reporting that, yes, there's something it's like for him to be happy. Lana, same thing. I asked Lana, is there something like for you to be happy? She agreed. Okay, so she's 11, I think. Um, then I got to Jonah. He just turned five today. So today is his birthday. But he was four when I asked him the question, Jonah, is there something that it's like for you to be happy? He just says, Dad, I'm not going to say. So that ended that. <laughs> so, you know, but that's fine. Um, but yeah, so I, I love what your, your, your point there is that we can just pay attention to those experiences and they include tastes, smells, qualities of all sort. And then I would argue also the experience of someone having the experiences. Yeah. The meanness. I, I really like that. I really like those more basic questions because those, those are things I haven't asked before of myself even, but even to like, like uh, graduate students and like high schoolers, I'm going to start asking those questions. Like, well, what does it feel like to be happy if you're for that, for that person? And somebody, I just really want to see what these high schoolers will say. Yeah. <laughs> That's really fun. Well, I was, in, I was in graduate school and I had a professor in the philosophy of mind, Robert Hanna, philosopher of mind. And he would have us do these experiments in class where we close our eyes and we just collect data. So he said, okay, everybody close your eyes, you know, and then, you know, <laughs> intend to raise your hand and focus on your intention. And then he asked us this question. Okay, now notice, are your arms going up? Now, do you need to make a new intention or does your original intention continue to make your arms go up? And we're like paying attention <laughs> to try to get information to answer his questions. Yeah. And I love that because I think that as philosophers, we're sometimes so quick to move into analysis and arguments. And something I really appreciate about um, the sciences, sciences tend to emphasize, let's collect some more observations. Yeah. And you don't have to be a scientist to do that, right? And so yeah. I think just paying attention to your experiences, that's a way of collecting some observations before you get into the analysis. And I think that's so important. It's just, I don't think yeah. I can overemphasize just the value of that. I think sometimes the analysis leads to kind of a, a deadlock. And then to weigh, the way to break the deadlock is not always to do more analysis. Sometimes we need to just collect some more observations. Collect more data. My, yeah. my viewers will probably especially appreciate that right now because right now we're, we're in the middle of like a philosophy of science um, series highlighting just like some more Bayesian methodology stuff. Yeah. So um, my viewers probably will appreciate that a lot too just because um, we just covered the Duhem Quine thesis and kind of like yeah. um, some of the issues with that and all that jazz. So, okay, we're not to derail us there um so we've we've covered this um third theory or yeah third theory now a question that might come up here and i don't know if you want to get into this right now or say or just point to other work is this question of me like muriological nihilism versus muriological universalism i'm not really convinced that there's a strict dichotomy between the two um i'm kind of in the in I don't, I don't have a full solution to this. I'm going to kind of show my cards there, right? I'm not a universalist um, in terms of muriology, but I'm not a nihilist. I think I'm in between somewhere. When something becomes an object, it's kind of really muddy to me. Um, so somebody might have questions when it comes to that topic here. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Because I can see somebody saying something along the lines of like, look, if I am this group of atoms, you know, or if I'm a meteorological nihilist, even like, I don't know what it means to say that I am a group of atoms. Right. So, right, right, right. Yeah. So the, this is good just to define the terms, right? So the nihilist yeah. is going to say uh, the meteorological nihilist, meteorology has to do with parts and holes. So the nihilist is going to just say, you know, there aren't any composite objects. Yeah. Um, we can talk about tables and chairs and people, but that's just sort of useful ways of talking of plurals of things. Mm -hmm. um, the universalist goes to the other extreme and says like, for any objects, those objects compose something. And then there's the restricted view that says some objects compose something, but there are other collections of objects that don't compose something, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanna say that this is one of those topics um, that in graduate school and beyond that I was just like obsessed about. Like this is what I would talk <laughs> about with my friends. And then when Rachel was my girlfriend, you know, I talked with her about it <laughs> and she liked it. I mean, we talked about oh, it. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Whenever I try to ask my wife about these questions, she just, get, everybody gets really annoyed with me <laughs> whenever I ask these muriological questions. That's normal. Questions. Yeah, it's very normal. <laughs> so, yeah, there was one time 
because Ra- Rachel does like to go into these things at depth. But there was one time where even even she was feeling like impatient <laughs> with <her. laughs> like Josh, like it doesn't even matter. Like what what's at stake here, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, everything's at stake. The nature yeah, of us, exactly. the nature of reality, right? Yeah. And so those those um, parts and holes uh, puzzles have puzzled me quite a bit. Um, but I feel like I've I've gotten some more insights, especially just sorting out the options. But one of one of the insights I just want to kind of lay out right here is just to understand that we have conventions, I think human conventions for treating objects as unified, even if they're not unified in themselves. Like for mm-hmm. example, um, you know, here here's a bunch of particles arranged like a book. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I sort of think of these particles as unified as as a book and my mind gives it sort of that unity. So we have conventions for treating this as the same book. Even if I rip out a piece of paper, is it now, has the book vanished? Is it a different book? Is it replaced? Yeah. Well, I think we have conventions for treating it as the same book. And then there are puzzling cases like the ship of Theseus where Theseus' ship where um, you replace the parts and then you reassemble the original ship with the original parts. Is it the same ship or different ship? And my thought is that our conventions kind of break down. Like we don't get clear answers out of our conventions. It, it's sort of like um, asking in the story of Superman, is there an even number of particles? Yeah. It's like, well, the story doesn't really make that specified. It's like, Oh, is it odd? You know, it's either even or it's odd. It's like, no, the story doesn't specify the, the number of particles. And I think our conventions are sort of limited in that we don't answer every question that the philosopher can ask about yeah. parts and holes. And that's where a lot of these puzzles come up because we're trying to use our conventions and the conventions don't answer the questions. But here's the thing where it gets really interesting for me when you start talking about our own existence. See, if I exist, my existence doesn't depend on a convention that I made up. It's the other way. The conventions that I make up or that we collectively make up depend on our prior existence, I think. Hmm. So unless we go back to the theory that we don't actually exist, which we could re-explore that, yeah. um, but the first person data, I think, is, is sort of a clue into uh, our existence. That's one clue. So if, if I exist, then what I'm going to argue is that those conventions for treating things, this is kind of a breakthrough in my thinking just even in the last year, set a park with my baby, just pondering and pondering and pondering these breakdowns and in, in our conventions. And I was thinking, oh, I think what's going on here is that we're trying to apply the conventions that we use for treating objects as the same for practical purposes. We're trying to apply that to these real uh, metaphysical entities, or you don't have to use the word metaphysical, but like these, these things ourselves. And, um, and we can't answer the questions we're trying to answer, because those conventions don't really answer all those questions. But this is where philosophy comes in, because I think logic can give us demarcation of uh, which yeah. answers lead to certain implications. And I would even say um, problems. And then this can help us to understand what we could possibly be in relation to the, to the atoms conventions yeah. aside, because again, the conventions don't answer all the questions. And so th- this is part of the mere logical universalism and, and nihilism yeah. is that our conventions kind of tell us, that my left nostril plus the moon isn't a composite object. Our conventions don't have any practical use for that. Yeah. Okay. But then philosophers come in. I mean, and I was one of these philosophers in my first book on truth. I talked about how, well, you know, my left nostril plus the moon, that makes up this thing that I'm going to call a fact, the fact of my nest, my left nostril existing and the moon existing. And that makes true the proposition that those things exist. And the fact exists. It has those things as parts. So, so yes, there is an object there, and and then and then I realized, well, I don't know if I need facts to do truth, and and so you know, but but the, these are the kind of questions the philosophers are trying to figure out because we want to know what's yeah. actually real, what's real. Yeah. So we have yeah. to answer and these questions. That that's why, and that's why this that question of Mariology is just always like on my mind, and it's just it's always on your thing. mind. <laughs> that's intense. <laughs> it's one of those things that's always bothering me. It's just like okay, well, like. The, the, the question about your book right it's like okay but is it a new is it a new thing or is it not because i i can see one of the things that i can see here is like somebody who's a mirological nihilist and an eliminativist um like they 
they might take issue with kind of our approach to this. Um, and so I, th those are incomplete thoughts that I have in my mind at the moment. Well, just if as we're I talking, can offer but... a way of possibly completing it, because yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If you're a nihilist, you might say out of the gate, all there are are parts arranged in certain ways. And so what this means is that um, either I just am parts, mm -hmm. atoms, Okay, that's what theory two, um, or I don't actually exist. Yeah, because if you think and, and there was a philosopher who gave a talk at Notre Dame, and this was actually his argument, his argument was from mere logical nihilism to our non existence. Um, and it was a beautiful argument. But this is where I think the first person data maybe completes your thought in a way because the first person data is a a way to look into a treasure box and see, hey, inside this treasure box, until you open it up and actually do the observational work, you can't know what's inside of there. But if yeah. you can do the observational work and you can witness, hey, there's a reality there, there's someone who has thoughts and feelings, then that's going to be an argument against the nihilist view or um, the the um, the no self exists or nobody yeah. exists view. Um, it's not yet an argument against the nihilist view, right? Because there's still the possibility that you're simple. Okay, that, yeah. that's a possibility. Um, and maybe we'll come back to that at the end yeah. <laughs> when we're done looking at all the other options, right? Um, but I think that what this philosopher who gave a, a talk at Notre Dame, I think the insight that he had was that there's a deep challenge for seeing how you could exist if your existence is going to be analyzed out of mindless bits. And we'll, mm -hmm. again, look at some of those challenges as we go yeah. along. Um, but that's where I would say that Nihilism by itself is not a problem. It's just that if you open up that treasure box and see first person data that reveals your existence, then nihilism is going to limit your options or that treasure box is going to roll away nihilism because it's yeah. going to basically say, hey, you know what? I exist. I'm not simple. Therefore, nihilism isn't true. It yeah. Can't be true. Yeah. No, I like that. Okay. So we're already at 45 minutes. So I think it'd probably be best if we keep going on Do it. <laughs> instead of derailing things here. Um, so the next view uh, is the view of being like a set of atoms, correct? Or yeah. And we can cool. do this one briefly because yeah. the set view is just like the plural view, except let's say that you don't like the plural view, that you're a plural of atoms because you say, no, you're one thing. You're one being. You're not many things. And so then one way of responding to that is say, okay, you're one set and the set has the atoms as its constituents, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then this set view is, has, I think the same problem that I just mentioned with the plural view, which is that it doesn't allow for me to persist through the changing of atoms. So I can't like put my fingernails or lose an atom out of my brain or anything like this mm -hmm. because sets have their members essentially, meaning that they can't lose their members and be the same yeah. set. Um, and so it seems like the first person data gives me some evidence that I can continue to exist. I can continue to have thoughts and feelings. It's still me. Even while my states change, I'm the one who changes in those states. So I'm still me. Um, and so therefore I can't be the same thing as a set, uh, which loses atoms. The set loses its atoms. The set's no longer there yeah. or it's scattered. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then what's the, I forget what the next theory is off the top of my head. Now. The arrangement uh, theory. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So I, I just want to say th these are not decisive challenges. These are kind of opening challenges and sort of reasons that many people kind of continue along this path and say, okay, you're not a plural of atoms. You're not a set of atoms. You're not a single mindless atom, mm -hmm. but maybe the solution here. And this is what my wife tells me. It's like, Josh, why are you spending so much time on these? theories that you're just an atom or your mind is nobody believes that. And, and, I, and I have to say, Rachel, it's because these other theories down the road have their own problems that are so severe that yeah. they make philosophers revisit the first ones, right? <laughs> or just remove their existence entirely. Um, this yeah. is not uncommon. So, so the next one is the arrangement theory. And the arrangement theory is supposed to solve this problem of um, losing your parts. The idea is that it's okay that you can clip your fingernails and still be you. It's okay that the atoms in your brain can be swapped out for duplicate atoms. Maybe mm -hmm. every seven years, all your atoms get sw uh, swapped out or whatever. Yeah, that's okay. You can still be you. You can still have you know feelings and thoughts and 
memories and all this stuff um, and be the same you having the different memories in different states. Um, I, I say the same you, what I mean is you change in states, but as an individual, you are the one who's changing those states, if that makes sense. So you yep. continue to exist and you can have different atoms. And so that means in order to maintain your existence, we have to identify you with something that continues to exist. So here's an answer. There's an arrangement maybe into a brain or a functioning nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that arrangement is you. So even as the atoms move away, so here's, here's some atoms and they're in a certain arrangement. And even as those, some of those atoms get moved away, some other atoms come in. And as long as the arrangement is maintained, you yep. continue to exist. Yeah. So I, it's helpful to like really just think about like your brain right now and the chemical reactions going on. And then yeah. just think about that. Like there's a certain arrangement or functioning of those particles into those reactions. And as long as they are functioning in just the right general way, you mm -hmm. exist. And not because they make you exist. It's because you are that arrangement. That That's thing. what you yeah. are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And so I think the way that I thought about this, I was trying to explain this to um, one of my students the other day as we were just kind of talking about stuff. And the way I tried to explain this to them was... I changed the word arrangement with just like shape. Um, Cause if like you, if you are the arrangement of particles that form brain wise, right. Then maybe it's just the shape of the brain and it's not the actual like internal simple parts of the brain, but it's just the shape of the brain that's being maintained and the functions of it and all this. Well, I don't want to say add functions into that, but you get what I'm trying to say. Do you think, yeah. do you think that's fair? Like of this view to call it like maybe instead of an arrangement for, the lay person to understand it as like shape wise or yeah the shape or function i mean it, yeah you know shape is a bit crude i, I like that yeah. i like to say shape um and then people say well josh it's not really a shape you know it's a it's a function it's like when it comes yeah. into this state then it produces this output and it's like okay it's more of the same i mean the idea the idea is that <laughs> there's some particular state of these mindless atoms and you mm -hmm. are that state, whether the state yeah. is a shape, a functional state, whatever that state is, yeah. you are that state. Cool. Right. Yeah. So, so what are some issues with this? Um, I think I remember from your talk, one of the things you brought up was if, for instance, like the shape example, right? If I, if I am identical to the arrangement of this, <laughs> right? Like, how do I persist when I put my arms down? Um, that might be one issue that I remember you kind of brought up. It wasn't that example, but that's kind of just the way I, I, I go. Yeah, that was kind of <laughs> right. a preliminary issue that, right, exactly. I like how you put that, that basically um, it looks like you can continue to exist even as the arrangements change. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of a preliminary issue because then I kind of came back in my talk and said, well, maybe we could reply by saying that you're a more general arrangement mm -hmm. or more general state. So as long as you're changing within the general state, like I can move my arms, my brain molecules can change, but as long as they're sort of within, you sort of imagine like scattering the atoms. So it's mostly empty space, but you keep scattering them and scattering them. And it, yeah. it, it, if you scatter them to a point, I'm going to, if you go too far, I'll snap out of existence because well, it's not a snap, right? But like I'm done <laughs> existing yeah, yeah, because the arrangement, the general arrangements not maintained. Um, that would be, kind yeah. of a way of protecting the arrangement view because this is kind of interesting to me. It's like the, the plural atoms view, it has the problem of permanence that it means that you're more permanent than many people would sort of take themselves to be. Um, and it kind of locates you in the wrong place. Your atoms leave you and then, but I'm still over here. I'm not with my atoms. Um, so there's those problems. The arrangement view you might think has the opposite problem. It makes you too fragile. Like you can't persist through changing arrangements. But then I think, well, as long as the arrangement is general enough, um, that can maybe protect the view, yeah. right? So yeah. then you you posed a reply to that as well, I think, right? And um, yeah. what exactly was that? I, I actually well, there are a few different challenges that I would raise uh, to the view. But one challenge has to do with thinking about this problem of what distinguishes you from your states. So um, 
I was actually just sharing this with your friend Parker uh, an hour ago because we were talking about the idea that uh, we could have particles in the same pattern, the same arrangement, mm -hmm. but they're duplicate particles. Okay, they're not even your own particles; they're duplicate particles, but they come into the same arrangement, the same function, the same shape. Uh, to use your language of shape, yeah. If you just are the state, if you just are the arrangement, then that means you exist whenever that arrangement exists, right? So just to kind of draw this out, um, in the book, I, I give this transporter experiment. This is sort of mm -hmm. a philosopher's thought experiment, right? Where yeah. you go into the transporter and the way the transporter works, is going to annihilate all of your atoms. Your body is going to be just vaporized, okay? For, just for sake of argument, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. But it's okay because they're going to create some duplicate atoms on the planet and they're going to put them in the same arrangement as your original atoms. You're going to survive on the arrangement theory because yeah. you are that arrangement. So this is great. You know, these, these Star Trek uh, people who made these transporters, they, uh, they understood how they could build their technology on this philosophy Yeah. Uh, by preserving your arrangement. <laughs> so this is wonderful and it works flawlessly. You know, you've seen it work a thousand times. I mean, you personally haven't gone on the transporter, but you have seen, you know, your friends, your brother, your, you know, all, all everybody, you know, has gone on the transporter. They go to the planet. And the person on the planet says, hey, it worked. I'm over here now. Right? Yeah. Now, do you go on the transporter, Dan? No. <laughs> Why not? What are you worried about? Uh, I'm just, I, I, so my intuition tells me that I have no way of knowing that those, that the per, let's just say it's part, let's just say it's Parker that goes to this tra transporter. Yeah, right? Parker. And I'm talking to, tra I'm talking to Parker and he's in, like 30 galaxies away and he says it worked i'm here my my i just there's something i don't know exactly what it is but part of me is just like how do i know that's actually the same parker that got dematerialized um that's over 20 galaxies away now like it, it could be it could be it could very well be a different parker and i don't really know for sure that it, it isn't that's at least yeah. just kind of like my, my first response, yeah. my, my first thought there. Well, let's say we could convince you of the arrangement theory. Mm -hmm. Then you would know. As long as you know the arrangement theory is true. Yeah. Okay, that's true. So then what would, what would, what would you say? <laughs> well, so here's the second part of the experiment. So yeah. you go ahead. We convince you. Um, Parker and I together, we convince you. <laughs> We're like, the arrangement theory is good. We Parker just had a says, whole... don't put me through that thing. <laughs> We just had a full conversation on patternism and we're convinced that you just are a pattern. So you go on there and something kind of cool and interesting happens. So there's a malfunction and the machine fails to destroy the atoms on the ship, but it does still duplicate your atoms over on the planet. So now for all of us watching, this is what we see. We see two duplicate arrangements with the same pattern, the same arrangement, different mm -hmm. atoms. They both have a continuity with the original. So they both have a feeling of being fan and they both have your memories. Let's just stipulate all of that. Yeah. They both claim to be you. So from the outside, we're sort of perplexed. We're like, well, which one is it? Okay. Yeah. Now, logically, philosophically, we understand that the individual, the token individual is not both. Okay. Because there's a difference between being the same in type and being the same individual. You can yeah. have two, two individuals of the same type. Okay, so we understand that that um, that you, Than, you, the individual, are either still on the ship, or you, the individual, are now on the planet, and a duplicate yeah. of you is on the ship. That's what we understand, right, from the outside. But you have access to that treasure box, that first-person data, the awareness of yourself. And here are a few options of what you might experience now in this situation. One option is you might experience yourself both on the planet and on the ship. So yeah. you just have this dual awareness all in kind of one consciousness, right? This is, you have access to this, right? Like, oh, I'm aware of both. Um, or you just are experiencing yourself as aware of yourself on the planet or you're aware of yourself on the ship. Um, but the point here is that that first person information about where you're at is not captured by the third person descriptions of all the molecules and where they're positioned. So the, the molecular descriptions of, of the atoms and where they're positioned 
leaves out that first person information about where you're at. And I think what this highlights is that you have every right to be worried because um, if the pattern view were true, then you are literally identical to the pattern, the arrangement, the type. Yeah. So you are literally on the planet and on the ship because the same pattern is in both places. Um, it's the same pattern, right? Yeah. And so if instead you're aware of yourself on the ship, then to me, that's that's an observation, as a first person observation that I think would challenge the the arrangement view because the arrangement view doesn't account for the individual you still on the ship. While somebody has the same arrangement of you as you, they're not you. Yeah, I'm just thinking. Yeah. Yeah, so my <laughs> the thing about philosophy, right, is like it it just seems like you can come up with a way out of anything. Go and so like it. one of the ways one of the ways out that somebody might come up with here is just by they might they might deny something like the law of identity, which I've seen some people make here. And would that be a way to out of this then? Because you could say something like, okay, so the two fans that are ones in a galaxy X and ones in galaxy Y, but they both, they both exist and they're identical. Um, and it's, and that's okay because they don't have to, they might say something like, well, they don't have to share the same spatial temporal location in order to have the same identity or something like that. Well, there's what? also a law of non-contradiction here. So okay. if, if you have an awareness of yourself on the bridge and the guy on the planet does not have an awareness of himself on the bridge, then there's something true of you that's not true of him. And um, so, but if you're the same thing, then you're going you're gonna to get a contradiction because it's going to be true of you that you're aware of yourself on the bridge and not aware of yourself on the bridge. And that's just a contradiction. Gotcha. Um, okay. So I, I think it is very severe. Um, I'm not saying there's no ways out. I mean, one, one kind of reply is that, well, maybe there are particularized arrangements. So maybe you are the particularized arrangement on the ship. Mm -hmm. And then there's another arrangement that's particularized over there. Um, I would actually just lump the particular, a particularized arrangement under the uh, unified whole view, because the idea then is just that you're something other than the mindless atoms. Um, and you somehow bind them together in some way. Mm -hmm. And so then we'll look at different ways of understanding the unified whole view next. Um, but the idea that you're a, you are a general abstract arrangement, I think does lead to this, this deep, deep problem um, yeah. of how you could possibly have a duplicate that has the same arrangement, but that isn't you. So I think yeah. that that's a problem. That, that's why I don't hold to the arrangement view myself. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that makes sense. So I, I'm, I know we're taking questions like at the end, but Parker asked a question that was something also I wanted to ask, but I didn't know how to um, ask it yet. I was trying to like talk to you and think of the question at the same time. So he asks, so what if my immaterial mind is correlated with this exact arrangement or pattern of myriological symbols? Destroy this pattern, reconstitute it over there. Maybe my soul follows. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Every, that's consistent with everything we've said so far. Um, okay. and, and then the only thing that I, I wanted to comment here on is that word immaterial mind. Um, just because the word material is open to wide ranges of interpretation yeah. for all my purposes at the end of my discussion here, everything that I'm going to say is going to be consistent with me being material. I just want to say that because my own view is that um, I have a mind and mentality is prior to the mindless but that's consistent with me being um, still material. Uh, I just want to yep. say that, but that's a little bit of a distraction. I just want to um, affirm the question to say, yeah, that that's a possibility as far as this goes. Um, you could go with the arrangement, your soul, your spirit, you, that's all open-ended as far as this yeah. goes. Awesome. Yeah. Did you want to move on to the next theory then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now okay so is the next one that the whole like you are unified whole theory or are we yes. on to the okay and then the next one is the immaterial self or well we just talked See, about you're saying immaterial, immaterial there, again right the yeah. First, yeah the the you're the mind first self how about that yeah yeah and, and even the unified whole is gonna have a mind first version of it yeah um right so just to kind of review the steps so we looked at the um you don't exist and then there's the you exist, but you are mindless. And mm -hmm. then we talked about how, okay, you exist, you have a mind, um, and you're multiple things. Yep. 
Um, but then that has the problem of replacement. You can continue to exist as things are replaced. So then we talked about the arrangement view that you're in arrangement, but then that has the problem again of accounting for your individual you versus duplicates that have the same arrangement. So what's the individual you? How is the individual you related to the mindless atoms? How, how does that mm -hmm. work? So now we're gonna do a theory that I call the unified whole theory that divides into two versions. Uh, one version is my advisor, Peter Vanewagen's view, um, which would be that you are a unified whole, you've got mindless atoms as parts, um, but there's a way in which you exist prior to your parts in the sense that um, your existence is not ground, your, the, ident the, the nature of you is not grounded in the nature of your parts. The identity of you is not grounded in the identity of your parts. Um, so that would be a kind of mind first view. Andrew Bailey also, I think um, his preferred model is something like this, mm -hmm. um, so a unified whole view. And so I think it's it's a notable view. The other one is a um, unified whole view, but the mindless atoms are the grounds of who you are, of your identity, of your existence and of, of your nature, okay? Um, and this is a mind for, mindless first view. So the mindless first unified whole view still has the problems of replacing parts. It still has the yeah. problems of understanding in virtue of what are you, you, if what grounds your identity are mindless atoms that can leave you even while you don't leave you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I have a passage in my book that I actually want to read about this. This is about this argument that I had in my presentation that I was telling you before the show that my wife says that she doesn't like this argument. And um, I, th I think she likes it, but she doesn't like uh, the way that it gets presented can lead to weird distractions. It's sort of a, a philosopher's presentation, but I, I do love the presentation. Um, and so out of sort of deference to my wife's advice, instead of trying to go through that argument in detail, I, I want to just read this passage out of my book that yeah. summarizes this problem. So I talk about this general problem of how you could exist from moment to moment. This is a problem of personal identity. And I talk about the transporter experiment. And then I talk about three different views of personal identity. And, and I actually end up rejecting all three of the views as a solution. Uh, the views are the body view, the psychological view, and the soul view. So mm -hmm. I don't end up saying that the soul view really solves the deep problem. Um, uh, because in the end, I, I think that there's a way in which your identity is not going to be grounded um, in your body, in your mindless, in mindless atoms, in your memories, in a psychology, or even in positing some other thing. Um, I think that there's a way in which it's just basic that you are you. Yeah. But let's just go with the mindless first view that you arise out of mindless dust. And it's in virtue of the mindless dust that you exist. Okay. So then... I have a series of problems uh, with that and my wife and as well as my 14 year old son, Micah motivated me to lead with more intuitive sounding problems, like the problem of replacements. You can survive the replacement of your parts, but I, I just couldn't help myself. I had to include this fun little brain minus problem uh, in my book, but I have a very abridged way of putting it. So I'm going to just read that here. It's just one of my favorite my favorite little arguments in philosophy. Yeah. I, I just find it very, very interesting because it's basically, I, I'm going to read this in a moment, but it basically shows that in order for you to exist, there's got to be a way in which there are some objects like these, these things here that just by moving something away from those objects, moving an, another mindless object away from the original unconscious things, they're individually unconscious and collectively mm -hmm. unconscious. Those things collectively become you. Um, they become you by moving something away and I'm gonna just read this and you'll sort of see how this works. So, yeah. so there is a related, more technical iteration of this problem, okay? This is the problem of how you could be you, even in clouds of particles going in and out. So to illustrate, suppose you clip your fingernails and you survive, okay? And, and if you think that the kind of being that you are doesn't include your fingernails, but you think it includes all the sort of parts of your brain, then just imagine that you clip a uh, one atom out of your brain, okay, and you survive, okay. So that um, that's the beginning premise. Now, 
in my talk, I say, even if you don't think that you survive, there's still a puzzle just for you to exist. Uh, there's still a remaining puzzle, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you the puzzle if you survive. So in this process, some atoms separate from your body. Okay. And this is the body of you. So we're assuming that you are, uh, your body, which is an organized unity of atoms. Some of mm -hmm. them leave your body. You clip your fingernails or you lose something out of your brain, whatever. So you lose some atoms. Now call the original atoms that remain in your body. Call these the originals. Okay. Those are the atoms that stay. Okay. You didn't lose those ones. Here's the question. Do these originals determine your identity now after you've clipped your fingernails? Well, they are the only atoms in your body. So if any atoms determine your identity, presumably these do, but how could they? A moment ago, the originals were a mere part of your total body. They weren't all of your body because a moment ago, your whole body included something else, included your fingernails. So these originals were not sufficient on your own, on their own to determine your identity then, right? They didn't determine your identity when you had your fingernails. But then you mm -hmm. clipped your fingernails, you move your fingernails away from the other atoms, and now those originals suddenly determine who you are. They form a whole, they form a unified whole. They were used, they used to just be scattered parts. Now they form a unified whole and they're you. But how, how is that possible? They didn't determine your identity a moment ago. So how could they determine your identity now? The fundamental problem here is that in general, if something is sufficient to determine who you are, your identity at one time, then it would seem to be sufficient to determine your identity at any other time that it exists. Because that which determines your identity, it's determining who you are, your essence, uh, mm -hmm. the thing that is you, okay? It's determining who you are. And so that's a necessary feature. If that is right, or at least it's sufficient, I guess all we need is that it's sufficient. Those atoms are sufficient to make you who you are. So as long as they're there, um, they'll make you exist. If that's right, then since the originals didn't determine your identity a moment ago, they don't determine your identity at any time. In other words, no particular atoms determine the identity of your particular first person self. Now, a big part of the book was arguing that um, you exist and that what you are is what you're aware of in first person self-awareness. Um, that's not a trivial step, but that is a big part of the, the project to, to support that. So the idea is that these atoms can't determine your particular first person self. Mm -hmm. And I guess really, I mean, even if you don't go into that and you think you're a third person brain, you still have the same problem. It's just whatever you are, whether a self from the first person or a brain with a quantitative description, the point is, is that as long as the atoms can be swapped in and out and you can lose them, no particular atoms are determining you. So from all this, it follows that if you can indeed survive the clipping of your fingernails, then your identity is not determined just by atoms uh, unified in your body, organized into your body. Um, something else is is required to make you you. Mm -hmm. And and so there's a way of really drawing that out. Um, Trenton Merrickson, his, his book, Persons and Objects, he goes mm -hmm. into these puzzles in quite some detail. Um, and just... I just want to say, like, as I analyze this and I watch my kids play with their toys and I'm thinking, can these things be conscious? Could could you move something away, leaving the originals, you know, clipping your fingernails, leaving the originals there? Yeah. Then now those originals are you if if you're grounded in mindless parts, because these are the only things that are there to be you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that violates a kind of intrinsicality of wholeness, going back to the nihilism and universalist. Yeah. Debates, like, you might think, well, how could these things suddenly form a unified whole by moving something extrinsic to them away from them? You didn't change any of their intrinsic um, properties or their internal relations to each other. And you might think that what makes something a whole is how the parts are internally characterized and related to each other. Something about that that makes them a whole. Now, people could debate that, but it seems actually to really make sense that... Um, we can explain this in another way. Like there's another way to account for your unification other than merely in terms of relations between mindless parts. We can account for your unification in terms of a conscious being that itself has a unified field of awareness. Mm -hmm. So this leads to that second version of the unified whole view, which is the mind first version of it. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this because it solves a whole bunch of problems. It basically explains how it is that you can still be you even as parts are going in and out. Um, it's not the parts, the mindless parts and their relations to each other that make you you. It's that you just are you. Okay. Yeah. And then, so, I mean, like what's, what's a good metaphor? It's like if you have a big blue um, sphere and then you have a bunch of red cubes and somebody's trying to say, here's how we can explain what makes the blue sphere the blue sphere. We can organize those red cubes. And, and then there's problems with that because of the sphere being different than the cubes, right? And you make mm -hmm. that argument. Well, you don't have to suffer from those problems if you have another idea, which is that there's just the sphere. The sphere exists. So you don't have to analyze how the sphere could exist out of the out of the um, cubes because you can just recognize that the sphere exists in its own right. And in the same way, it's not a perfect analogy, but it illustrates this one thing, which is that I think that you can recognize your own existence as existing in your own right as a unified being. And if that's right, well, then you don't need to try to understand how you could be analyzed in terms of the mindless particles. Yeah. You, are, you are a unified whole, unified by your own consciousness. Yeah. So so a question somebody might have here is like, on the, on the mind first view of the unified whole, what exactly is unified? Because you said that con like you're unified by your consciousness, but then what, yeah. what, is, what, is, what does that mean? That might be a I question think, that might come up. Yeah, I think that the content, so like thoughts, feelings, um, those are, are unified, as well as uh, kind of what makes this your brain? Uh, what makes mm -hmm. these your particles? And I think that has something to do with causal interaction. So I think that it has some sort of control through thinking and feeling over the, um, the molecules in my brain. Um, and I have a whole story about how mind and body go together. I'm not going to go into yeah. that now, but, um, but the idea here is just that, is that you as a being unify the elements within your consciousness into a single, let's say field of awareness, as well as you provide a way of unifying your effects. These are the effects from you. Um, mm -hmm. so that that's a way of saying that the particles are sort of like unified as belonging to a brain that's causally interactive with you. Yeah. Cool. And so that's that's the sixth theory. Do we have any more? Well, the Is final one, the seventh one, is yeah, yeah. that the atoms are not literally um, parts of you. Yeah. Okay. So it's not literally the case that the molecules in your brain, those chemical reactions going on, are like parts of you. They're related to you, um, but it's not a part-whole relationship. Yeah. Right. And let me just say that my own view has just until very recently has been more of the theory 6B that it's yeah. you're a unified whole uh, mind is somehow playing a role that's not reducible to the mindless atoms and all this stuff that we're not grounded in the mindless atoms. But more recently, I, I've kind of shifted over to theory seven. Um, and for various reasons, I won't go into all the different reasons, but just to say this is another option on the table where instead of it being a part whole relationship, um, you can sort of think about it more like uh, when I was talking with um, Parker about, he, he brought up like books and like recording his thoughts in books. Um, if, if I record my thoughts into a book and there's a kind of shaped formation of things that let me access mm -hmm. certain states of consciousness, certain thoughts, I wouldn't say that um, these words that represent me um, are literally parts of me, okay? I mean, you know, the, the, these words represent me. They're not literally parts of me. So I, I don't think it's a part whole relationship. And I've been thinking something similar with the atoms in my brain, that the atoms in my brain function as an accessing consciousness device. They it's sort of like a book in a way, give me a way of accessing certain states of consciousness within this world. And so if my brain is damaged, I won't have access to those states of consciousness. And this is why there's mind brain interaction. Um, but mm -hmm. it's not a parthood relationship. Gotcha. And so, and so that that kind of circles back to one of the questions that I had earlier today er, earlier, um, and that was of like interaction, right? And you kind of talk about this in your book, right? So what what is the big difference, I guess, when it comes to theory six B? Because it seems by my lights that theory six B falls in line with like hylomorphic dualism. 
probably. Yeah. Uh, would you agree with that? I and do. then yeah. and then theory seven. And then theory seven would be like this idea, like idealism, right? This mind first, um, on a, even on like an ontological basis. And so I think so. Yeah, idealism I think of as a version of it. Um, but maybe broadly conceived, you could sort of think yeah. about that. Yeah. And so when it comes to the interaction problem, which for, for anybody listening that might not know what it is, right? It's just that question of like, how does it on the theory of like on theory 6B and on theory 7, where we have the mind first, or you are something different than the material, depending on how you want to cash that out, right? How do those two things interact? Um, if we if we're okay with defining like material and immaterial as these different things, um, how does how do those so then how do those two theories six B and seven differ in so, in a meaningful way when it comes to the interaction problem? That's a good question, and I would want to kind of think this through because the way that I've organized this in my own mind um, is that like all the major theories like have a mind body problem. Um, but each theory mm -hmm. is going to have sort of different tools for yeah. dealing with it. Uh, I mean, e even if you're an identity theorist and you think that mental states just are material brain states, uh, there's still a question about how the material mental states that are brain states um, interact with the material uh, non-mental states. Like, how, how does that work? There's still that mm -hmm. question about how that works. Um, and so, you know, some theories are going to have problems that other theories won't have, obviously. So when I'm thinking about the mind-body interaction problem with respect to these final two theories, the ones that kind of make mind first uh, yeah. or give, you know, you're not analyzing the mind just in terms of the mindless atoms. You're not grounding them, you in terms of the mindless atoms, but that you actually exist in a way that's like prior to or independently of those mindless atoms. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, okay, well then how, how do I interact with the mindless atoms. And so let me, I, th I think I'll just kind of sketch a little bit about my own view just to kind of mm -hmm. illustrate this. So in my view, I have certain capacities to generate certain states of consciousness. So I have a capacity to generate thoughts. I can have a thought about zebras. Now this thought about zebras, I wouldn't say is a basic thought because it's built up out of more basic elements, more basic con concepts. Mm -hmm. So my capacity to think about zebras is based in more basic capacities um, to think about, um, you know, maybe the, the kind of the qualities of a zebra that sort of fill out my concept of a zebra. But now these most basic capacities together give me the capacity for certain states of consciousness. Okay. So that, that's the first part of my theories. I have some basic capacities that allow me to have more complex capacities for states of consciousness, like thinking about zebras, having certain feelings, right? Mm -hmm. um, the second thing to observe is that these states of consciousness aren't themselves conscious. Okay, mm -hmm. this is kind of a tricky idea, but it's important. These states of consciousness don't have a mind. They're not conscious beings. So my image of my wife, Rachel, that image is not a conscious being. It's maybe a representation of a conscious being, mm -hmm. but it's not itself conscious. So right away, I can recognize that I'm a product of some mindless things. So I'm, I'm something that has a mind with some capacity to produce some mindless things. And mm -hmm. then this opens up a large scale sort of philosophical opportunity for, for thinking about a, a reality in which mentality can be prior to non-mentality. Because again, I'm, I'm a mind and I can produce thoughts and images and feelings and those things don't have yeah. mind or non-mental. So, um, if I can understand my spatial form as itself a product of um, consciousness, okay, my spatial form as a product of consciousness, my, my spatial form, I think, is, is mindless, doesn't have a mind, mm -hmm. um, but it's connected to me. It's in a mind. It's in my consciousness. And so the way that I, I think that this works, and this is kind of a larger part of my theory, is that at the base of the material world, I'm happy to say that I'm a material being. I, I'm happy to say that as long as we understand that the nature of matter itself can include mentality and is not mm -hmm. fundamentally characterized in terms of spatial relations. This is so important because when the physicists are saying that space-time is doomed, 
when when Carlo Rovelli is saying that spatial aspects of reality merge out of informational aspects, what I hear them saying is that the spatial aspects of matter aren't fundamental. This opens up the idea, and this would be my working view, that the basic nature of matter itself has mentality. Um, and so because it has mentality, it's able to do the sorts of things that we know in conscious experience, like form imagery, form thoughts, form laws, form structures, form patterns, form an organization of, of things. And this doesn't answer every question, but it, it allows me to explain how I can interact with my body because the way this works is that my very body is itself a representation within consciousness of me. My yeah. body is like an extrinsic picture of the internal conscious states. And so, of course, as the internal conscious states change, that's going to have manifestation and its extrinsic relations to the rest of the world. And of course, as the brain structures change, that's going to affect my conscious experiences. Just like right now, if I'm reading a book and somebody takes the book, which is itself mindless, mm -hmm. and removes it from my field of access, I have no access to the book, then I can't access those conscious experiences that the book helps me access unless somebody replaces the book with a duplicate. If somebody yeah. takes my brain away and destroys it, but replaces it with a functionally equivalent brain right away, I'm good to go. I can keep having a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and this, by the way, can help solve those puzzles of replacement. Yeah. Because now you see how I can still exist even as the parts are replaced in and out. It's because I'm not reduced to the parts, but the parts facilitate my interaction. So that's it. That's, that's, I mean, yeah, I love that summary, but yeah. And so somebody just really quick, um, before we kind of move on, somebody might hear what you just said and think that you might be even talking about like a form of panpsychism. Um, if they hear you say something like at, at fundamental reality, like you, it's mine first, but like, it's, um, somebody might think like is there and well, what, what would you say if somebody said that? I love that question because, again, I think these views are, they have a range of interpretations. Yeah. But in my understanding, the sort of panpsychism and idealism kind of meet at the horizon point. So the panpsychist sort of starts with the idea that, okay, there's a material world and consciousness is deeper in than maybe we thought. It goes all the way to the foundation of the material world. But then there's this combination problem, which is the problem of understanding how, even if the little bits of material reality are conscious, do they organize to form conscious beings that have unified perspectives? That's the combination problem or the binding problem, sometimes it's called. Yeah. One kind of response that the panpsychist has offered is a kind of cosmo pan, uh, cosmopsychism. Philip Goff offers this. Yep. Where the idea is that we can solve this binding problem if the base base of the material world is not actually multiple parts, okay? It's not multiple mindless parts, and it's not even multiple mental parts. The base base of the world is a whole, a conscious unified whole that has parts that are posterior to the whole. This is like theory 6B, yeah. but just applied to all of reality, Yeah. right? That's a beautiful theory. Now, at this point, I scratch my head because I, I read uh, Ca uh, Bernardo Castro, but he, he represents... He's one of the figureheads for idealism today. Um, John Foster is a, a philosopher uh, who also has done some great work in idealism. I and mean, there's a number of philosophers who have, but sort of in contemporary scene, it seems like Kashtrip, um is doing a lot of kind of sciencey, empirical and analytical work in support of idealism. And so he says things like, and he's against the panpsychism, but it seems like what he, his view sort of collapses to panpsychism in my mind at the horizon point, because he says things like, well, Everything is in consciousness, but it's not that everything is conscious, right? So, so he wants to say everything's in consciousness, but the base of reality isn't itself conscious. Okay, but if we have that cosmopsychism view where the whole of reality is a single unified reality and mm -hmm. everything's within its consciousness and it's fundamental, then I start to lose my sense of distinction between this view and, and Kashrup's view um, so, because ultimately consciousness is primary and everything else arises out of that. Yeah. I, that makes me think back to one of the things you brought up, which is like, I have the ability to produce non-mental states. Like for instance, my wife's name 
is also Rachel, right? So <laughs> when I think about Rachel, right, um, that picture in my head of Rachel is not conscious. So yeah. there's there's this thing within my consciousness that's not conscious, just like yes. what, what you what, what you just said. And so couldn't that also just be a reply to or an answer to that problem um, that you just brought up? Yeah, absolutely. Or uh, exactly okay. it. Yeah, no, that that's it. You you got it exactly. It. So like all the, the particles that emerge out of the hole, um, those particles are they don't have minds of them themselves, their own. They're yeah. they're mindless. Okay, but they're mindless contents within the great mind. Yeah, and the great yeah. mind is the mind of the fundamental reality, the fundamental matter. You could call it matter, the fundamental stuff of existence, whatever it is, um, and it it is. Uh, capable of, of consciousness is the idea it's the the people yeah for anybody that's listening to this that's just kind of <laughs> maybe getting annoyed by uh, how careful we're trying to be when we're saying the word matter it's I, I just want i just want you to take a moment to really think about this and in your head try to define what matter is and i think you'll find that what you're really doing is like giving properties of what matter might be but we're really not defining what it is and so that yeah, exactly. And so that's why it's 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 a very interesting question and why I think philosophers, when we might sound really annoying when we're talking about this kind of stuff, it's because it's not as crystal clear as we might really think or take for granted for. And so I was invited to blind review an article on this question of what matter is. And, and they were making the argument from science and conceptual analysis that we could understand matter in a way that is uh, compatible with being non-spatial yeah and others have said that we could analyze matter in a way that's compatible with being conscious and so in my kind of reply to the review i just said yeah i mean that's fine i mean it conceptually it seems like there's space for that um and we could even combine this and say yeah it could be material and mental and uh, fundamentally not even spatial but mm -hmm. that's only because we're understanding matter and its functional uh, relational ways, but we're not filling it in intrinsically. If we do fill it in intrinsically and we say that intrinsically what it is to be material is to be located in space, um, then I would say I'm, I'm actually pretty convinced that I'm not fundamentally material in that sense. Yeah. Really pretty convinced. I would agree with that. All right. Well, is there anything else you wanted to kind of hit on or talk about before we went on to questions? How much more time? How much more I time think... do you have left? I think that's it. I, I've got um, just enough time for questions and I feel like we covered the steps, um, you know, just to say that this was, let's say, an introduction to some of the major yeah. theories and some of the challenges um, and that there's really innovative work to be done on each one of the of the theories and important research projects. So my goal here, you know, I hope people can see my goal here is not to kind of like knock down every theory just to get to mine, but to you know, share my cards and kind of tell you where I, I'm at, but also yeah. to highlight each theory, distinguish them, and then really draw out some of these ramifications that take some analytical work to see. And then once you see them, I think that gives you more power to analyze them. Yeah. And, and I think this is really helpful. And, and I really appreciate your approach to this because it's very exploratory versus um, apologetic in nature or like dogmatic in nature. It's it. We're, we're exploring consciousness and what it might be, what you might be versus just trying to prove a theory. And that's one of the things I really appreciate this about this approach that you have. Well, thank you. That, that's what I've loved so, about philosophy myself. It's like yeah, never ending my... journey to explore. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so I, I'm in the process of writing a book. There's two things that I, that I've, that I really want Very to do. Cool. One is I'm writing a book and, um, just my, my approach to getting to like why I think Christianity, mere Christianity is true. And the other thing that I want to do that I really want to accomplish at some point in my life, because I also just love theology, biblical theology and philosophical theology, is to write a systematic theology book, like a textbook. And every single time, like it, it, it's like every three, four months as I'm working on these two projects, I end up scrapping something because I keep changing my mind. <laughs> and, and I'm just I changed like, my I, mind. I changed my mind in the course of writing this. Yeah. I how, did you, how, did, how did you publish oh, it? Oh, okay. Look, look, look. I, I had the general outline um, and I had a lot of things I was filling in. 
but it was interesting because I was giving some options mm -hmm. and then I was saying kind of what my current working hypothesis was uh, among some other options. And then as at, you know, I, I got very obsessed with the book and I was reading a lot of other books as I was mm -hmm. doing my revisions. And so in one of my round of revisions, I came to that, that place where I said, this is my working hypothesis, but there are these other options. And I realized, wait, that's not my working hypothesis anymore. I've moved to this other option. Yeah. So I had to update that, that part of the book. Yeah. I, at this point, especially with my like systematic theology textbook that I'm working on, I think what I'm going to do instead is present it as a range of options for each different types of doctrines and just outlining what's at stake and the implications if you hold to each of them. That's so something. helpful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause like my, my project, my project at least with exploring reality, especially is not to go out and prove my specific views because they're always changing. Um, but also I just, I think highlighting the explanatory flexibility um, of Christian theism is a lot more important than proving the specific theological doctrines that, I might hold to or somebody else might hold to but it's empowering it gives people power to think with more options i think yeah yeah and that, that's what i love about this so all right questions um john asks <laughs> question for josh goatsmith <laughs> how does your favorite view capture or make sense of what neuroscience tells us about comatose patients yeah thank you uh, so my understanding is that in my view the mind and body are causally related. And this is going to allow for there to be different kinds of states that a being with a mind can enter into. Um, so for example, I could go into a state where I'm just completely unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. I mean, I'm still real because I wouldn't say that I am my consciousness. I would say I am the thing that has my consciousness. But I don't always have to be conscious for me to be, if that makes sense. Now, Bernardo Castro, I mean, he makes the argument, actually, that you are always conscious. And he goes through kind of a, a lot of detail, making the argument that even if you think that you went unconscious, really, you were conscious, but you didn't remember it, um, or you're conscious of more things than you realize and all this stuff, like you don't have to have higher ordered awareness of your awareness to have awareness. So that kind of opened my mind to an idea that I hadn't really held before. Um, but currently, it's sort of intriguing, you know, the idea that yeah. you are always conscious. Um, but it's not it's not essential to my view at all. Um, and actually, I would say, you know, I'm not really sure what to think about it. But I mean, I would say my, my current view is that, you know, I, I don't have to be conscious to be real. Um, and so I think that the way that the, what neuroscience is revealing is that there is these correlates between neurological states and conscious states and that these correlates actually grow out of a more fundamental reality that gives rise to both types so i this is what i call a substance uh, view where substance emergence actually where mm -hmm. i think that both types of states emerge out of a more fundamental reality and that more fundamental reality is capable of causing things to come together into systems and to which can then generate programs um I'm, I don't want to go into all detail on this, but basically yeah, yeah. the idea is that what the neuroscience is revealing is correlations. And, and I do think that the correlations indicate causation, but the nature of the causation, I think, comes from a certain kind of being. And that certain kind of being is able to integrate these different things. It has capacities to integrate mind and body together. Um, so that's kind of how I, I'm thinking about that. And it allows me to go unconscious and to be conscious. Yeah. Um, Kevin non tradicath asks oh says this point about introspection is probably my biggest hang up with who are you really at this time although i'm only halfway through um defining introspection this way seems to almost question beg dualism um what would you say to that it's interesting actually to have a passage in the book about a worry like this you know that mm -hmm. am i just question begging if i am appealing to introspection um to make an argument for consciousness, for example, thoughts and feelings. And this is very difficult. And I, I love this question because it's pointing to a very basic tool, a very basic tool. Um, and it's hard to argue for basic tools. You know, if, if somebody says, you know, I'm not sure if we see anything with our eyes, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even sure we have visual experience, right? Because maybe you're skeptical. Maybe, maybe you think that you're brain in a vat or you're hallucinating. Well, do you have, uh, do you have visual experience? Like, 
well, how do you even know that? And my approach in the book is try to argue that introspection is actually part of what we need to know anything in science. Um, and the reason why I like to do this is because I think a lot of people who would be skeptical of introspection would tend to utilize uh, the tools of scientific inquiry. And they would say that we can make observations of trees and then we can come up with an analysis of those observations and come up with hypotheses and we can test those. And my argument is that you don't need introspection to observe a tree, but you do need introspection to notice that you're observing a tree. Uh, you need introspection to uh, notice in your own mind the implication of your hypothesis about trees and deduce things in your own mind and notice what those things are so you can write them down in your scientific report. So, I mean, I, I would argue that that science itself requires this introspective power. And that if you turn off the light of introspection, everything goes dark and we are um, deep, deep into pits of skepticism where you can't even yeah. know that things are dark. Like you can't even know that you have doubts because I mean, think about it. Like where, where are your doubts? Yeah. Do you look <laughs> into your brain and say, oh, there's the neurological structure of a doubt. So I must be doubting. That's not, that's not what you do. If you find yourself, well, I'm not so sure if, Josh's case for introspection goes through. How do you know you're not so sure? Did you check your brain? Did you check the functions of the accents? It's like, no, you use introspection. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what else I could say, you know, and, and I say this, I even say in the book, you know, there's a longer conversation to be had with the, with the skeptics of um, introspection and, and consciousness. But, and so I appreciate that. Um, but we are rock bottom. I mean, <laughs> It's, it's hard to go deeper than rock bottom, except to just say, hey, you know, if, if we turn off the light of introspection, I think we got to turn off some other lights. So that, that's that's my approach. Yeah. Um, Kevin also asks, do you think that the parsimony advantage of neurological nihilism should prompt someone to seriously consider nihilize, the nihilism motion? My instinct is to say yes, um, you know, just on its on its own. Uh, I think that having fewer posits that can explain all the data is a good thing. Um, so, so yes, um, I think that's right. I think that also though, if I include my first person data, then I, I want a theory that's simple, as simple as possible, but that is not incompatible with all my data. And so if yeah. my data includes my own existence, then if I'm a neurological nihilist, that's gonna imply that whatever I am, I'm simple. Um, and may maybe that's true. <laughs> I mean, so nothing in my book rules out neurological nihilism. In fact, I, I do have a chapter on yourself and I talk about neurological nihilism in that chapter. Mm -hmm. And there I just try to make distinctions so that look, either there are no holes or there are holes, either way that uh, you exist. So that's, that's yeah. my approach. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, this is a question that is going to come up in two parts. So question for Dr. J, on this issue of being you and causal determinism, do you agree with Dr. McGregor that so long as the causal arrow moves from the essence to the habitudes, um, the notion of an essence can be expanded to include such accidental properties? This is a very deep question. I love this question. Yeah. And I'm not sure I really know the answer to that. I'd really like to think about that. Um, okay. I love that answer. I love yeah. that answer. <laughs> Sorry. Just, I, mean, like this, I love this question and I, and I'm tempted to just like say stuff, but I think it's something I'd, I'd like to kind of ponder a, a bit. Yeah. Um, it's a very profound and, and good question. Thank you. Um, all right. How many, we'll, we'll take like two more questions here. This one's, this one's a fun idea. Um, because you already know that I'm working on that stage two and you helped me kind of look through some of the stuff here. Somebody says, will you guys do a stream after you release your stage two video? We'd love to see Josh and you talk about this. I would love <laughs> it as well. I'm excited awesome. about what you're putting together. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm putting in some final touches. Um, oh, it's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be good. You, you heard it here, guys. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen it and it, it's so well put together and the use of concrete examples to draw out the steps carefully i'm i'm excited to see what you come up with i'm 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 right now the like the last two arguments that i have to like solidify are the oneness and total power arguments 
the no, I should say the last three ones, the oneness and total power arguments, um, the necessity of it being a mind argument. And I emailed you about that. Yeah. And then that like ne the evil God challenge slash necessity of it being good cha okay. um, series. Yeah. So I'm just kind of like trying to, it's hard to put those things in like a narratable way, but yeah, I'm working on those. So, well, when, once we're closer to that, I'll email you about that. Yeah. And that's a really fun idea, Cosmo. So thank I, you. I would love that. Yeah. And, and I'm saying that it's going to be good because I've seen your um, drafts of what you've done so far. So that's why I'm, I'm saying it's going to be good. That's yeah. a, that's a huge, that's a huge compliment. I'm writing a high now. <laughs> um, okay. This is a fun question. Are you certain, whatever that means, that you exist or have a mental life? Or do you think that you can be fundamentally mistaken about those ideas? Maybe both. Um, <laughs> maybe both. <laughs> so um, I think that I am certain by direct awareness of a mental life and of my own existence. And I also think, and this is not a trivial uh, situation, but I think that I've come into states of being directly consciously aware of my direct conscious awareness mm -hmm. of my mental life. And it's in those states where I find myself like the most certain. It's like, oh, but right now I'm telling you this from memory. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like being very honest. Like I've had these experiences of really just pondering, okay, thought, there's my thought. I'm just aware of it. And then this other thing happens of like being aware of my being aware. Mm -hmm. And that gives me, I think that's how I get, no, I think that's how anybody gets knowledge of awareness. Yeah. It's not through a theoretical posit. It's through awareness of your awareness. This does not lead to an infinite regress because it's not that you have to be aware of your awareness to have the awareness. It's that the awareness of your awareness gives you, um, <laughs> I was just going to say, awareness of your awareness knowledge it, it gives you it gives you the knowledge of, of of what it is um and so can you be aware of your awareness of your awareness maybe but you know that takes some work i don't know if i've ever done that now can yeah. i be mistaken so i mean i always this is kind of like my rule it's like i can always every belief i have is open to disproof i'm always willing to be wrong i'm always willing to be mistaken and maybe metaphysically so this is why I sort of hesitate because I have a, a weird theory that like nobody that I know holds, but I think it's probably right, which is that if you are actually maximally sure of something, then that's because that's what it is to be directly acquainted with reality. So that mm -hmm. it is impossible to be maximally sure of X and be wrong. Um, that's not actually a standard view. M most people would say you can be certain of something, but that feeling of certainty is not itself like, metaphysically entailing that you're right. Um, but but I guess the view that I've come to is that it actually does metaphysically entail that you're right. So if so the, then, then people respond to Josh, are you saying that if somebody's absolutely sure of something that they're not wrong about it? And then I say, yeah, they're not wrong about that. And then they're like, Josh, how can you say that? Haven't you ever met somebody who's like absolutely sure? Haven't you ever been absolutely sure? And then you were wrong. And then I say, well, I don't think, I don't think I was like, absolutely sure maybe i was like very very close uh you know and it's possible to exaggerate right um, mm -hmm. and it's also possible that people are sure of slightly different things and so maybe they are both right but they think that one of them is wrong you know so so anyway i'm taking a long time with that question because i i love the question so much yeah and uh, and, and i appreciate that but um i think i i kind of want to say maybe yes I, th I think i'm i'm certain am i certain that i'm certain not at this moment so I probably could be in yeah. principle, but yeah. Awesome. There's one more question here. And I love this question because it's it's related to something. You said something at the end of your book, and I'm and I'm pulling up the book right now to try to find this quote that you had in the book, because I don't remember it off the top of my head. But John asks, um, how do we begin if we do? And can we end? And you have a really fat fun quote. Um while you're putting it up, let me yeah, just say a few things. So I'm actually working. I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. This is the first time I'm, I'm revealing this to anybody, except for my wife. I'm actually working on a, a, a small book that's going to be sharp and deep um, in ways that who are, you, who are you really? Well, who are you, are you really is, is pretty deep. 
Um, but it, it's going to address this question in some detail, how we begin based on my latest, latest thoughts on this. Um, this is, this is just a, one of these very, very fascinating mm -hmm. questions that I've had. Like, how could you begin, especially toward the end of the book, I talk about how it may be impossible for us as selves to be destroyed, at least not by scattering atoms. And I am convinced of this, that you cannot be destroyed by scattering at scattering atoms any more than you could be destroyed by scattering um, thoughts in your mind um, or mental images. Mental images could roll out of your conscious awareness and you would not cease because you are not grounded in your thoughts. You're prior to them. And I am convinced that you are not grounded in the mindless atoms. For some of the reasons we talked about, the myriological puzzles, it's not the only reasons, but those are some of them, and that you are deeper in. And what that means is that is that scattering atoms, scattering images, those will never destroy you. Um, they will change your consciousness. And so it might be by scattering certain atoms, you will no longer have access to this environment. Um, you'll go to, an, you'll have access in, in another way. You won't really go anywhere because I don't think you're fundamentally spatial, but your spatial experiences will change. Um, your experiences will change. So, so I don't think scattering atoms will destroy you. Well, then this leads to the question, this beautiful question. How do you begin? What, what can make you, right? And in the book, I talk about how I think you're made out of the basic stuff of existence, the, the ground and mm -hmm. well-being. Um, and you couldn't be made in other, any other way. Um, and I'm very serious about this. I mean, I, this is one of the views that it's, it's controversial, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of forced to it yeah. by the problems with the alternatives. So then this still leads to the question, well, then wait, how do you actually begin then if you're made out of the basic stuff of existence? How does that work? And I'm working on a new book, a short book, and I want to release it at some unexpected time. And it's going to go into some detail on this. But my the, the, the way that I'm thinking about it is that you begin in the way that maybe a statue begins to form out of some clay or the way that a wave begins to form out of an ocean. Um, there's a certain form that gets instantiated, certain psychological form that gets instantiated. It's a unique form that gets instantiated in the, the fundamental reality. And that carves out a um, piece of that fundamental reality. And so that in a way, that piece that's carved out doesn't begin to exist. That piece that's carved out is um, the basic stuff of existence. It, it, it can't begin or cease but it can begin to be carved out as you, if that, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, or as the psychological being that that is your portion of, of reality. And this seems to me to fit actually with a wide range of spiritual traditions. Um, there's biblical data, I think, in support of it, as well as the sort of uh, near-death experience accounts. Um, when people talk about consciousness and their relationship to God, a lot of things that they say fit very well with this this idea that that um, the basic stuff of existence is the stuff of of, uh, of of who you are, and so your beginning to exist is is basically like being carved out of fundamental reality. Um, so there, there's a way in which you begin, and there's a way in which you don't begin. You begin as a certain form, um, but the substance of you is 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 carved out of the basic stuff and that never that substance never begins yeah. so so th this is these are deep waters um that's why i'm, yeah. I'm going to write a, a new book on just kind of like this and some other things related to that do you have um, a title for the book yeah it's uh how to make a mind 10 things okay. about you that matter cannot make and by matter there i do mean spatially uh organized mindless yeah. bits of reality and i'm going to go through the 10 things and then i'm going to have this final chapter on what can make a mind and I'm giving my secrets away, but I'm going to basically say nothing can make a mind. Um, nothing can make a mind. So, so you're made not by your mind being made, but by you being sort of carved out of the fundamental reality. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. I, I, and, I, and I really like that. I really, I really, I will say. Okay, so when I say I really like that, because I'm still, I'm still like trying to figure these things out for myself as I'm trying to do all and as, as i'm trying to investigate these things on my own which is one of which is one of the reasons why i haven't really made any videos on this topic specifically yet because I, I haven't made up my mind but one of the things i really like about this view is that 
if it's true, it really highlights something that I think is pretty obvious, which is just how valuable people are themselves. Mm -hmm. Like when I look at you and I look at my friends, my family, even the people that make me upset sometimes, right? Like there's this very deep intuition of just this person, even if they're like really taking me off at the moment, they're just so valuable. Like, yeah. and, and, and like, I, I won't, it, there's something about it. Right. And what you're saying would make so much sense of that intuition that at least I, I feel that I have about people themselves. Cause especially if we parse out like this fundamental reality yeah. um, is, is um, we'll say like, if we, if we cash out perfection as maximal value, yeah. well then of course, right? Like people that are made of this maximal value are going to, where they're going to have value that we can kind of perceive. And Absolutely. That yeah. And so, that's one of those things that I really like about that view. Yeah. And, and your value is not anchored to the changing winds of your bodily forms or even your psychological changes. Yeah. It's deeper in. It's rooted in the, the self, the being. Um, yeah. And that, that does, it inspires me too when I get entangled with others. And sometimes I start thinking of them as their expression, as their set of traits. And then I realize, no, that's not who they are. They're the being just like me. They're actually fundamentally like no different than me and kind. And that, and, and it's the kind of thing that they are that anchors their value. So then that yeah. it has helped me very practically. Like even on social media, I sometimes get into these states and I start feeling a little bit frustrated. It's like, there's a, a mismatch of talking past each other. Yeah. And it's like, okay, wait, it's okay. Like actually that frustration is based in seeing things that are not fundamental. And if I can just remember that the fundamental things are just the treasures, I can still just treat the fundamental things as treasures while interacting with the non-fundamental things. Yeah. Like the non-fundamental things are the means to valuing and loving the fundamental things, right? Yeah. So it's very practical. It's not just theoretical philosophy. It's like it actually makes a difference in yeah. my relationships. And how I think <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. All right, Josh. Well, we're almost at the two-hour mark. My wife probably wants to <laughs> have me help her out with the kids some more now. Yeah, likewise. Um, yeah. I really appreciate your time here. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, if you have any more questions on any of the stuff that we talked about, please just reach out to me. Um, ask. You can always email me. And um, yeah, I just I'm really thankful for this, Josh. This was so much fun. And I'm really looking forward to just kind of getting more from you. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Until next time, God bless you all. Thank you. The mindless stuff.